Hello, Miami. It's so great to be here with you guys. You know, it's not too often that I get to come out to this side of the world and get to meet uh, the broader tech community, if you will, which obviously you guys are all leaders and members of. So thank you so much for making time to be with us uh, together this evening. Um, I would love to share with you uh, some of my learnings, some of my experiences, but in, in true tech fashion, everything is open for a question. Uh, these are all ideas, these are all suggestions. Uh, some of them I've collected through my experiences, but you know, challenge me. I, I really want to be here to have a dialogue with you as opposed to, if you will, uh, speak to you. All right, uh, quick uh, background about me. If you want to look up my other links, that's my website. Um, you know, the most uh, fun thing that, that I feel I've been really privileged uh, to do in my career is the opportunity to be involved in the various facets of technology, both as a builder, as an investor, and as an advisor. And that has given me the opportunity to study hundreds of products, to study lots of successes, lots of failures. And the narrative that I'm sharing with you today is related to that, right? It, it has, if you will, this is a distillation of certain things that I've observed to just work consistently, or for that matter, not work consistently. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what we'll be talking about. Uh, Maria, thank you again. I know this was a very last minute exercise for you and, and you pulled it all together. So another round of applause for Maria. Well, I had the, the great fortune of being housemates with Fernando in college. So if you guys, you know, those of you know Fernando really well or would like to get to know him really well, just come to me, I'll have some great stories for you. Fernando uh, is, is obviously a great product leader and thinker in the Miami area, and I know he's been consulting and advising lots of investors, lots of uh, product managers to be, so thank you, Fernando, for making this happen. Um, just a quick uh, caveat, all views and ideas are strictly my own. Great products. So we, we all talk a lot about you know what makes a product great, and oftentimes, one of the things that I was told when I was trying to build a great product, solve a problem really, really well, better than everybody else, and you're well on your way to building a great product. True. This is a true statement. How many of you can relate, by the way? How many of you in this room have heard this? I see some people smiling. I'm curious. Quite a few of us, right? Go build something great. But how do I do that, right? What does great really mean? And let's, let's spend our time together today to unpack what that greatness means. So obviously, great products do a great job at serving people, right? Uh, this is the, if you will, the hot list of top applications on the iTunes store today. Many of these you've heard of. We can all agree that, by and large, these apps serve the people for whom they were built. And the, the idea of serving great people is really understanding the psychology of the people whom we are trying to serve. Right? Remember, it's not about whether or not the work is getting done. Whether or not your app is functioning, that is necessary, but it's not sufficient. I have to feel, as the end user, as the person whom you're looking to serve, I, as the user, have to feel that I'm being looked out for. Right? In fact, the magical thing is you can sometimes make a lot of mistakes, but if you make me feel like I'm being cared for, that I'm a customer who matters to you, you actually have a ton of leeway, a ton of leeway, right? Look at what's happening in myriads of products, right? Uh, I'm, I'm going to be careful about naming names here, but let's let, let's pick our favorite, right? When when we go to an Apple store, right, and you talk to someone at the Genius Bar, they don't make you feel like you're talking to, if you will, a genius on a high pedestal, right? They make you feel important. They make you feel like you have a real problem which they care about, and then they work with you to solve that. Right? Uh, if there's one thing you take away from this entire talk uh, this evening, uh, I hope it is this. I hope you think about how does your product, how does this thing that you're bringing to the world make people feel? That's really what it's all about. I'm going to unpack feelings into six buckets. And I'm going to be using uh, this great guy by the name of Tony Robbins. Who here has heard of Tony Robbins? Wow, quite a lot of you. Excellent. The man is a genius in my books. He's got, you know, many people call him a motivational speaker. He is. He is very motivating. But I think of him as the best applied psychologist that I know, right? 
when I read his ideas and insights, he tells me things that I can immediately apply, even as a product maker, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about. His claim is we all have six human needs. All of us do, the same way that we need air, water, we need to meet our six human needs, and, and we all do, by the way. The question is how we go about meeting our needs. That's, that's the open question, but we all figure out a way, one way or another, to meet our needs. So let's start with the very first need. The need for certainty. The need for certainty is a critical need that all of us need to, to meet, one way or the other. Okay? In the world of tech, I'm sure, uh, you know, for those of you who have been around uh, long enough, who, who have had to use this desktop computer situation, you know what I'm talking about. See, there's a reason, there's a clear psychological reason why this frustrates the heck out of you. Right? The psychological re reason is that your need for certainty, not only was it not met, it was just, you know, kicked way out. It's like, dude, I don't care about your certainty. I'm going to hang, I'm going to freeze whenever I want, and, oh, by the way, uh, you know, if you do this, which you kind of have to, uh, you will lose any unsaved information. So uh, there, there is no way out. What does that do to your need for certainty? It, it completely ignores it, right? And this is, this is, if you will, in my books, one of the highest sins around the need for certainty, or rather to not meet the need of certainty. Uh, let's look at a few more. Fail well, right? Huge huge pain point in the world of Twitter. In fact, Facebook, same thing, right? Sorry, uh, Friendster, same thing. Friendster was on a, on a massive success trajectory. In fact, their success is what got them into trouble is because their site slowed down, right? People have a need for certainty that they want the site to work when they show up because they have an intent, they have a problem that they're looking to get solved. I'm gonna expand a little bit more on certainty. Uh, just, just to convey to you the psychological insight here. I don't know if you've ever met someone who has, you know, just had a major accident or almost had a major accident. Do you, you know the look on their face? The, the pale look, the, oh my God, my, I almost lost my life look, right? The reason why it's such a strong emotion is because they have certainty, they have plans, right? They have plans that for the next five years, I'm gonna do this and then I'm going to do this, and then this will happen, that will happen. All of that moved in one second, right? I'm not saying this is in any way, shape, or form comparable to that, but that's how deep the need, uh, the need for certainty really is, right? You, you want to know that when you wake up tomorrow, things will be okay, and if for whatever reason that may not be the case, that is uncertainty, that kind of uncertainty in your life, and we, we figure out a way to fight that. Now, there are a few other examples here where the, the jewel of certainty is put in the hands of others. So if we look at our next slide, uh, you know, ma massive Amazon Web Services outage. What happened here is companies, really good companies, put their uh, success and their reliability in the hands of AWS, Netflix, Spotify, Pinterest, right? The end customer, whom we are looking to serve, is not gonna know whether it was AWS's fault or not. They're just gonna say, hey, Netflix, you failed me, right? Or, Hey Spotify, you failed me, and that removes the certainty that the end customer experiences in using your product. Now, if we look at one website here, how, when was the last time you remember Google.com not working? In fact, I'm glad at least one person has the experience. Okay. So you know, the interesting thing is that there was an experiment done on this, all right, and. On one occasion, when Google.com was not working, people didn't even think that it was Google's fault. They called Comcast. They said the <laughs> internet provider could have screwed up, but Google cannot screw up, right? That's called being a cornerstone of certainty, right? When people know you're just gonna work, you're gonna be there when I need you, right? If you can do that for the people who are whom we're looking to serve through our products, that's, that, that trust, that reliability is gold. But, on to the next slide. Uncertainty, you know what? Uh, life has a sense of humor, right? Just as certainty is a critical need, so is uncertainty. Talk to somebody who wakes up every day, or rather who has to wake up every day and have the same bowl of milk and cereal, no choice whatsoever, you have to have to do that. It gets boring after a point, like come on, I want change, right? I want something different. 
uh, I, I spend a lot of my time in Singapore, and in Singapore, every single day the weather is the same. Huh. And we kind of get bored, you know, we want some change, and, and we envy the people, you know, living out on the East Coast with four seasons and so on, right? You want some surprises in here. So let's let's look at the Facebook feed. I'm, I'm sharing my, my personal face, Facebook feed here. Uh, Facebook is the master of uncertainty. Absolute master. When you're scrolling your news feed, do you know what makes the news feed so addictive? It's your need for uncertainty. You never know what's going to come up. You don't know what's going to come up. So what do you do? You keep scrolling. That's, that's literally what's happening. That's the psychology of this product. That was not done by accident. Someone thought about meeting a very important psychological need. Look over here. I know you can't read this, but it says, Riley brushes her tooth all by herself. Well, with a little un ultrasonic help. Even if you glance at that for a millisecond, what would you want to do? You want to see what that is, right? And then you're rewarded with this really cute picture. Excellent. Need for uncertainty met. Delighted and surprised. And then, of course, you'll scroll on to the next post. And, you know, before you know it, uh, you've been meeting a need for uncertainty for an hour. And, and it's time to get back to work. Okay. Any questions thus far? So we've talked about the need for certainty, need for uncertainty. Just like air, water, we, we need these things, right? The need for connection, another very, very critical need. If the famous story, right, man stuck on an island, only person there, makes up a face, right, using a coconut head, just so that there's one person to connect with, right? We just need to be with people. Even the introverts, even obviously the extroverts, you know, you know like myself, uh, people think we need to be around people all the time. Introverts, you need people too, right? Um, WhatsApp, the genius behind WhatsApp is this, it actually just focus on that one critical need, right? It purely solves for the need for connection, but in a highly reliable way. Any communication application at the core connects you to people, right? If you're able to have a technology that connects you to people, that is fundamental human need. That, that is a fundamental human need, and therefore your application is going to be successful. It is no surprise, if you will, that the, the messaging genre of applications has been so successful, it's meeting this need. Now, it, there's more to it, obviously. You, know, you, you want to be able to meet that need reliably consistently, and that's difficult to do, and that's what made players such as WhatsApp successful in the business. Significance. So just as there's a slight amount of polarity between the need for certainty and uncertainty, there's also a certain amount of polarity between the need for connection and the need for significance. Whereas with connection, you're looking to relate to everybody around you and to form uh, you know, similarities, connectedness, with significance, you're almost looking to do the exact opposite. You're trying to set yourself apart, right? All of us do this, right? And we set ourselves apart through our, our sense of style, through our uh, appearance, through our career choices, so many things. But we also want to be unique. We also want to be significant and important. So if you look at Twitter, right, notice how they baked this into the product. Have you ever heard anyone talk about how many people email you? Right? What, was that ever a vanity metric? <laughs> oh, I get emails from a million people. Oh, whatever. I get emails from two million people. No. Right? How about the number of Twitter followers? We hear this all the time. Right? You hear, you know, at this point, Katy Perry, number one on Twitter with 102 million followers. Right? This does meet her need for significance. And You'll be surprised at how often the number of Twitter followers is such an important vanity metric for people that even if they have a great communication capability on Facebook or on a myriad of other channels, they won't let go of Twitter. Why? They have invested in building their significance on Twitter, right? Who can relate to what I'm saying? Great. Uh, very few pro products. Uh, May took advantage of the significance factor. But you know, Facebook actually made really use of this, right? So Facebook started out, if you will, as an exclusive Harvard only club, 
Now that's a club that many people would like to be a member of. Excellent opportunity to use significance as a growth vector. Because guess what they did? They said, okay, well now that it's you know been proven in Harvard, we're we're gonna open it up to Stanford, Columbia, and you know, at some point even Yale, right? Uh, huge opportunity to convey exclusivity. Significance is the reason why you know clubs have long lines outside them because you want people to feel, gee, it's it's a big deal to get into the club, even though they're charging you fifty bucks to get in, right? It's not like they don't have space. Same thing happened here. This was an exclusive club that required you to be anointed to get in, and that that drove the desire for people to want to be in it because it met yet another psychological need. We've got two more needs. These needs, very few products. Uh, directly aspire to me, and arguably, if we meet the need for growth, we actually get all the others for free. If if any one of us is pursuing our need for growth, uh, you can actually achieve certainty because you, you're certain that you're getting better. The exercise of growth is full of uncertainties. Uh, there is significance in growing and becoming better, and there is also uh, a lot of connection that, if nothing else, you feel with yourself as you as you push yourself to grow and uh, become better. So if we go to our next slide here, uh, you will notice that in this list of top applications, see how you always have games in that category? You know, games are brilliant at making you feel like you're growing. Because you hit level one, great, let's go to level two. Can you do better this time? Okay, great, let's go to level three. It's a very, very well understood psychological need, right? So the need for growth is the idea of Am I becoming better? Am I achieving mastery? Am I achieving some kind of a skill? If I am, you're meeting an, an important, interesting need, and hey, if you're gonna make it easy for me to, to meet that need, excellent. Now, uh, that may or may not be uh, the kind of growth that's most beneficial for the person, but it feels like growth, right? And because it feels like growth, you're almost hardwired to want that growth. There's another application here called Sarha Haha. If we go to the next slide, uh, I, I just discovered this application and it's literally called that. Uh, this application is interesting. Jump to number one on the charts. Number one on the charts. This app is an app about giving honest feedback, right? The truest sense of growth, right? Fascinating, fascinating case in point, right? In a market, in a world where you have so few applications, that are directly, authentically meeting that core need of growth. You have this application, this is literally a screenshot from their website. You can tell it's been highly optimized in every form or fashion, right? And yet it's number one, right? So it just says something to, it's something very strong and important about focusing on the needs that you're trying to meet and, and if you're able to do that, uh, you know, this is, this is at least one example of what that could lead to. The last need is the need for contribution. Uh, you know, way back, way before I had come across this uh, Tony Robbins framework of six human needs, I was always curious, I was thinking, you know, gee, once, and we notice this a little bit more in, if you will, the Western world than in Asia, which is where I grew up. Uh, once people reach a certain degree of wealth, philanthropy becomes such a central tenet of their lives, right? And I was wondering, why is that? I mean, at this point, it's not like Bill Gates is trying to show off and say, hey man, I'm really great. What is it that motivates Gates to do what he does, or, or Zuckerberg to do what he does? And it's actually another psychological need, because the need for contribution. It's a need for contribution, by the way, that you know mothers and fathers stay up all night to take care of the young one. It's, it's because they want to contribute towards nurturing their child. So many people are heavily motivated by that. And, you know, if you look at Tom's, right, one of the prime examples of a company that made meeting the psychological need a core part of their company, their identity, with every per product you purchase, Tom's will help a person in need. It's a product that makes you feel good. Every time you wear that shoe, your need for contribution is being met, and Tom's knows that, right? That's why they, this is literally, the moment you land on that website, this is the first thing they put in front of you. I'm greatly appreciative of Tom's doing this, and it's also great business, which, which honestly is awesome, right? You're both creating social value and creating business value. So, in summary, uh, these are the, the six human needs. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Need for certainty, uncertainty, connection, significance, growth, and contribution. 
one doesn't have to meet every single need to build a product that is addictive, right? Meet two needs and you're very, but meet them well, right? And you're very difficult to replace. You meet three really well, you're, you're addicted. I mean, look, you know, ask yourself a question, take a minute, take a minute. Think about a product or an application that, that you absolutely love, right? And think about how it makes you feel, right? Does it make you feel certain? Yes, this is going to work. Does it make you feel, you know, connected perhaps to people that you care about? Or does it give you significance? Let's use the iPhone and, and the Android platform just for comparison for a second. Uh, true story, uh, on one occasion I had to make a phone call and my Android phone was frozen, right? And I had to make this phone call. Did not need a very fundamental need for certainty. How did I feel about Android at that second? Really awful, right? And I, I used to work for Google at that point in time. Uh, so, you know, I, I had that certain loyalty towards that platform, and yet I just, I'm like, if you cannot work as a phone, you cannot be a smartphone. Did not need me for certainty. I, I, even now, the platform has become much superior than it was back then. I just find it really hard to, to move on to the, you know, to the Android platform. I, I use the iPhone, I know it always works. Right? I know that uh, the updates which Apple comes up with, they're always interesting. Uh, there's a sense of uncertainty as to what's coming up next and what way it might be the uh, people such as myself. You know, it's certainly a key device for connection, although I wouldn't say that uh, the smartphone intrinsically is a connector. Significance, sure, it is a little more premium device uh, than most others. Uh, growth and contribution, not so much, but you know, they just had me uncertainty. Right, that's 99.99% that's of why I trusted you, the iOS device. Um, next slide. Uh, right, I guess that's the end of our time. So, <laughs> I, I hope some of this is applicable and you know, finds its way into your thinking as you go about designing and building uh, your next set of uh, products, your next venture, really any relationship because ultimately products end up having a relationship with the end user. People end up having a relationship with the company. Study that relationship and unpack it using these six dimensions and see how, how they score and see where can that score be improved. It's critical to meet one or two needs really well, and if you can do more than that, then you're, you've clearly got uh, a magical product in your hands. Thank you so much. Uh, you uh, yeah, you know, I spent uh, seven years in Singapore. Were you born in Singapore? No, I didn't have to do Army. Just curious to see how you got from Singapore to Google, to Facebook. And that's what I'm here. A lot of good luck. <laughs> so, um, Facebook and Google, both companies that you worked at, have huge teams of, of software engineers. Being a software engineer, I know how tough it can be working with huge groups. So how does a product manager like you um, work with these large groups of engineers to actually meet these needs and build these products repeatedly. Repeatedly, right? Not just one question. So one of the things that we didn't explicitly talk about was there's a huge difference between the needs of the builder and the needs of the end user, right? As a builder, myself included, right? I am also looking to meet, meet my six needs, right? If we could actually go back to the slide with the six needs. Uh, so, this is, this is a fascinating uh, case study and I'll, I'll address your question directly in just a second. People often ask, gee, why did company A copy company B, right? Uh, and why did company, let's say X, they could have easily just copied company Z and they would have been super successful and yet they didn't do it. So Twitter, I don't know if you guys remember, they used to have this star button for favoriting a tweet that became a heart button, okay? You might be surprised to know this, but it literally was a CEO level decision to change that star into a heart. I was shocked when I heard that, right? And, and the challenge is that the builders behind that feature, that capability, attached the uniqueness that they associated with the star to their own significance. Right? They felt that I want to be special. As a builder for this product, I have decided that this is going to be a star, and so it is. Right? 
it literally took a massive longitudinal study where they said, look, this is a number of people who don't understand what star means because, you know, star can mean good bookmarking, can mean come back to it later, whatnot. You know, I Googled the, the phrases also uh, mixed up. And uh, it was an executive decision to say it's going to be a heart here on Earth, right? All because of trying to meet the need of significance of literally a, a handful of builders behind the product. So when working with engineers, I really try to understand what is that they're trying to accomplish, right? And whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish, how does that ultimately translate into value for the people who we're looking to serve, right? It is important to meet the needs of the builders, but let's meet it the right way. Let's meet it in a way that, that ultimately meets the needs of the people who we're looking to serve. And that's, that's something that I spend a lot of time understanding with the engineers I've worked with is I, I spend time understanding what is it that they're really trying to achieve. Are they trying to solve a difficult problem? Why are they trying to solve a difficult problem? Why is it important to be working on something difficult when, you know, uh, trying to scratch my nose like this is more difficult than scratching it like this? So is, is difficulty the intrinsically interesting point or is impact more interesting? And at Facebook, we've got a huge focus on, on focusing on impact. Right? Let's let's create value for ultimately that's what matters. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you. I have a question for you. Yes, How would you use this needs um, in the lean startup scenario for uh, idea validation? So the the question was, how would you use these needs in the lean startup scenario? Uh, you know, I don't completely subscribe to the lean startup well, way of thinking. I think too often people think about. Uh, minimum viable as very minimum, but they forget about the viable part. And I, I think the principle is great, but applied incorrectly, it's not that useful. Uh, I see a lot of people thinking about MVPs as being, okay, great, I'm just going to make something and push it out there without spending a lot of time thinking about what is it that I'm pushing out and why does it matter, why would someone use up their time and energy to actually use this product. Uh, so. All that notwithstanding, uh, you know, focus on one need, right? Minimum viable, what is a great way to meet a single need and meet that really, really well, right? If, if we can start there and, and serve that need really well, pick the second need and I think you already are well on your way to, to creating a winner. So, um, so Zuckerberg recently announced that he wanted to create more community, town halls, things like that, I guess that goes on the connection. Uh, do you have any insights around how you're going about triggering users to um, to adopt that or to use it more or to connect in any way? You know, I don't have any specific comments on that. I think it's just we, we are a very people-driven company and we love well connecting with people. Uh, I think that's the type of What are the conversations or, or, or questions that the teams are asking themselves right now working through? to achieve that vision, that sort of um, I don't know how to comment to that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, you're working on enterprise right now, right? Yeah. So how would you say that this changes when you're focusing on a B2B product? Uh, I don't think it changes that much. You know, ultimately we are looking to create uh, in any enterprise product, right? It's looking to create, uh, deliver a reliable offering to its customers, right? Uh, Every enterprise product is also looking to delight the end user, uh, and delight comes from a surprise, right? Something that I ex you know, didn't expect to receive, but the product is offering a lot of uncertainty, right? So honestly, this applies in that situation. So I went to Emerge, and a lot of the key concepts and principles that they were talking about are focused on AI, connectivity, and the internet of things. And kind of piggybacking on his question, um, and how you answered it so eloquently about value, sort of using all these needs to be able to create value in your product. Where do you see us headed in our ability to create value in line with the Internet of Things, alter, uh, artificial intelligence, and connectivity? Because I know it's a big focus in the tech industry. So. Yeah. So it gets ever more increasingly difficult to be able to create value in light of the competition that's out there. So uh, what can you? Uh, what kind of insight can you give us on that? Sure. Um, don't have a silver bullet. Uh, but I think that it's really useful, you know, in the world of machine learning, Internet of Things, all of these uh, new tools that we have at our disposal today that, you know, we, we may not have 
really had access to five years ago, they ultimately allow us to do things that could not be done in the past, right? I walk into my home, and if my home is a smart home, it can adjust its temperature to, to my liking, right? It can maybe turn on or off certain lights to my liking. Ultimately, what does that do? It makes me feel more connected to my home because I feel like my home gets me, right? In fact, if I can now take that identity and make it portable, so imagine the same way that you sign in to a certain website with Facebook. If I can sign into a hotel room with my personal identity, I walk into my hotel room and uh, the Marriott, and the temperature is set exactly to how I like it. The, the curtains close exactly when I want them to. The alarm is already set up the same way that it's set up at home. How do I feel? I feel at home, right? Home is a place that I associate connectedness to, right? So all of it comes down to not just the technology, a la IoT or machine learning. Um, these are all tools, right? Mobile is ultimately a, a toolkit, right? It let you put the computer in your pocket. It's what we do with it that matters. And in that same vein, IoT, machine learning, they open up new capabilities, but can we make use of that to make you feel connected? You know, we can use our hotel room example where typically hotel rooms, for those of us who travel a lot, I'm sure you can relate, they feel really alien, and if anything, they feel somewhat destructive <coughs> because, oh gosh, I'm not, I, you know, I, I'm in a different room once again, I, I don't know where the heck I am, and they can feel disoriented, right? We can fix that using uh, an intelligent application of IoT to at least meet the need for connection. In terms of product, it's super trying to be like, I'm head of product, I work in product, and job postings, say for a product manager, a head of product, you need to know how to code, you need to know how to design, you need to have the business acumen. It sounds like unicorns that they're trying to look for. What makes a product person brilliant? Um, probably besides being to able to identify one of these, what would you look for in product people? That's that's a great question. So what what does one look for in product person? What what, what do you? Well, I personally. If, if suppose you were to uh, not put you on the spot too much. Suppose you were uh, building a company and you needed to hire a product person. Who would you want to use? Well, I'm asking because I want to go into that path. Um, I have like 50 percent left brain and 50 percent right brain. I'm trying to look for something where I can use my business skills, but also graphic design. Um, I'm trying to find like a path that I can combine and I came into this. But in trying to look for jobs, it's like, do I spend time creating a sketch portfolio or do I focus more on my coding or do, like, do I go for an MBA? Like, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, great question. Okay. Uh, so the question for those of us who put it in here clearly uh, was, how does one go about pursuing a career in product management? Uh, you know, we've, we've heard a lot about technology and business hybrids, or technology and business and design hybrids and so on. Uh, how does one become that person, if you will, such that if, if one were to apply to a product management role, uh, they, could, they could really have a lot of impact? Out of curiosity, how many of you guys in the room are interested in pursuing a path in product management? I'm trying to figure that out. Okay. Cool. A handful of us. So, uh, you know, product management is something which uh, I've had the opportunity to do for a little more than 10 years now, and I think that it has started to come more into the, the foray. Uh, off late, it's, you know, as you mentioned, become a little more trendy uh, than, than it perhaps used to be before. Uh, but, but the principles and the fundamentals haven't really changed. Uh, quick anecdote, you know, my, my friend Fernando and I had this intense long debate about um, product management, and I was, I was encouraging Fernando to really go down uh, and become a product manager, and uh, I'll, sh I'll dissect that a little bit for our benefit. See, the challenge with, with product management is that it's intrinsically nebulous, right? It is by definition a job with no definition, right? And that makes people somewhat excited, and it also makes them wary. It's like, what the heck am I going to be doing, right? So, you know, uh, Fernando was a mathematician, ma mathematician uh, in progress way better mathematician than I was. That's why I decided to drop my major. Uh, but the, the beauty of, of product management was 
that it doesn't matter. He was a math major. I almost became a film major, right? Um, I did, in fact, many classes, including animation. Uh, I did lots of art, lots of photography, and you know, all of those things ultimately helped me become a better, be a better product manager. Uh, getting into product management becomes difficult because when someone is looking to hire product management talent, they really need to uh, distill signal from you know that that LinkedIn profile, that that resume, and understand. Okay, yes, this person gets product, right? If you here's an analogy that I often share, which I find helpful. Hopefully, it will help us uh, as well. Think about a product manager as a movie director. Okay, the movie director is not actually acting, right? The movie director is not even technically you know moving the camera around or whatnot, right? The movie director didn't even write the story. But the movie director is responsible for bringing it all to life, right? The movie director is responsible for the emotions that you experience when you watch the movie. In the same way, the product manager is responsible for creating value. The product manager is not responsible for shipping product, right? Creating value means bringing together business insights, bringing together the, the team to actually build, bringing together the technical insights and saying, hey, you know what? This, this thing that we thought would take six months to build, actually I just read about this cool new technology, we can build it in a week, let's go build it, right? A, a, a product manager needs to think about, oh, this is really difficult to build, you know what, let's just find 10 contractors and let's do this manually instead of writing some really sophisticated code, which may or may not work. So, akin to how a movie director's life is somewhat nebulous, right, and ultimately is, is determined by the effect that, that it has on you, so is a product manager's output on the product. Uh, to pursue your, your path in building, becoming a product manager, uh, I say go build a product, right? I think that is, the, the portfolio is not the mock, the portfolio is, hey, I built this, what do you think? Right, and there are many avenues which I recommend uh, you guys to check out. Uh, there's one thing called Startup Weekend. Uh, it's a weekend experience where you pitch some ideas and you go build something by the end of that weekend. That can be a lot of fun. Or just, you know, go build something. Go on Upwork, find an engineer. Uh, go build a Chrome extension that, that solves a problem that you care about. Because in that process, you will learn how to be a product manager. That's more important than anything else anyways. Does that help? What I'm struggling with now is obviously it's a complex process. There's a lot of companies that are pitching us their platform out of the box. They can make it a lot simpler, and they can. And but with that comes the limitation of do I build within and have more flexibility to create something around the needs of my specific customer, or do I go outside and have a third-party solution uh, and use this out of the box, you know, digital mortgage application, uh, stand it up in 30 days, but then I'm I'm fixed to. <coughs> So that's what I'm struggling with now. Yeah. I'm sure as a product manager, you probably dealt with that before. Yeah. Totally. Uh, how many of you can, Yanni, is that right? Yanni, Yanni. How many of you can relate to Yanni's uh, quandary here? Quite a few of us, right? Do something, you can move quickly, but you don't know what you're getting into. Uh, control everything, you know exactly what you're getting, but it's going to take a while. Maybe cost more, just more unknowns. Uh, you know, experience is the best teacher in these things. I think depending on the industry that you're in and the class of problems that you're trying to solve, talk to people who've been there, done that already, right? And get their input, get their opinion, uh, and recognize that it is input, it is opinion, because nobody will know your problem as well as you do, right? But it's, it's helpful to talk to others and get their insights, especially if they're um, in, you know, industries very, very adjacent to what you're working on. Uh, the other thing that, that I find really helpful, and this is what I tend to do, is uh, when, when I join Facebook, there's a big ethos, I don't know if you guys have heard of this, it's called move fast and break things. Okay? It sounds really sexy, right? It's like, yeah, I'm going to move fast, I'm going to break stuff, awesome, right? Uh, again, with a pinch of salt, I say that's a great piece of advice. As, as, as sexy as it may sound, it's actually very thoughtful as well, because there's so many unknowns that you don't even know there are so many unknown unknowns, right? That but just by moving really quickly, like make a decision, let's just go, you also uncover the remaining unknown unknowns, right? And then you are in a better place to make a decision. And by the way, you make progress, right? Because ultimately progress is getting stuff done. Uh, you know, thinking and discussion is is progress and progress, but it's not progress. Right? 
Um, so that's that's how I tend to operate. Is just just move because you don't know. Um, you know, personal opinion. Uh, I think that any vehicle that uh, can. This is true for Snapchat. This is true for YouTube, Google Maps, which I was responsible for monetizing. Uh, I think ads do a beautiful job of bringing to your attention things that may not normally come to your attention. That is their mission in life, right? Because if you already knew about this cool, awesome product, like fundamentally, an ad is what brought you guys, you know, brought us all together this evening, right? There was a promotional piece of content that was persuasive enough and informative enough to convey to you, let's let's come gather tonight and talk about product. Right, so I believe I'm a huge fan of ads in in that they persuade people to to make decisions, to learn, study, understand things that they may normally not be aware of. And if there is any media that has a lot of your time share, right, and that has uh, trust, right, that has your trust, I think I I almost wish that those media should have ads because it'll bring to my attention things that I would not discover normally. My question was that they're allowing them to now to message. So, you know, Messenger to me is equivalent to any piece of media that I utilize on a consistent basis. Right? So my, my response to your question is that any application that I spend a lot of time on can be a source of useful information, right? And I think any application therefore makes makes itself viable for a meaningful ad surface, so long as it's able to do that in an element form of value. Yeah? Um, it's been very insightful to hear you talking. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's always interesting to hear how different companies develop products, right? So what's the process that's been put in place? You've worked and had enough companies to have your favorite way of doing it. So beyond the ethos, as much as you could possibly share, what has been your favorite product development process? My favorite product development process I wish I had one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had one. If, if you know, the, the the more experience that I have, and at this point, I, I've shipped enough products to to know that I, I think I've seen enough libraries of how products get shipped, teams get formed, mistakes get made, impact gets created. I can confidently tell you: a, there is no right answer; b, don't go looking for the right answer. Uh, Especially the latter, because a lot of teams that I that I advise, a lot of companies that I invested in, they, they try to find out, hey, what is the right product development process, right? And and my advice to everyone in, in these settings is, don't worry about the process. Who cares about your process? We care about the product. Go build your product. Figure out what didn't work. Fix it, right? And do that over and over again. Now, of course. That is not to say that we will be overly simplistic about it and you know assume nothing and learn nothing from others. But I think it's it's a 50-50 game, you know, 50% experience and just trust that whatever you got, you know, your team uh, and your environment is telling you is right because your insights are, are deeper than the insights of anybody else because you're close to your product. I'll give you a simple example. How many of you believe A B testing is the way to go to optimize your product? So A-B testing, right, you, you, you know, you put an apple in front of a customer and put an orange, see which one works, apples it is, all right, now, henceforth it's apples, and then you keep optimizing, right? Uh, A-B testing has been all the rage, but I can tell you so many successful products which said, nope, no A-B testing, we know what we're doing, we believe in what we're doing, that's the right thing to do. Uh, apple is a famous example of this, right? And so many products that I've worked on, right, where A-B testing is the only thing we did, uh, Google search ads, I mean, it's many billions of dollars in value created just through optimization, right? So, for every example, you can find counter examples, right? So ultimately, it's, it's a function of what fits with you personally, what fits with the team. Now, there are certain things in that dimension that I would say are really important. You know, having a solid team that communicates really, really well, right? Absolutely important part of the process, right? Getting Inputs from a diverse group of people, critical part of the process. Think about Google Wave, for those of you who remember, uh, or Google Plus, if you remember that. Uh, you know, circles, I'm sorry, most people didn't understand it, right? Uh, 
it's very easy to, to believe your own story, but if other people are not getting it, maybe there's some truth to that, and maybe we should listen, right? Uh, I think listening to customers is great. Holding your own is also great, right? Uh, Apple always hated for doing one thing or the other that annoys people. Facebook was massively bombasted for the news feed. Now people love it. So, you know, there's just no right answer. Uh, Amazon has a really thoughtful product process of working backwards, where they write a press release, they study the metrics, they write an FAQ. In certain situations, in certain products, it works extremely well. Uh, other situations, it's just too much analysis. So, uh, my years of experience have taught me there is no right answer. What you think is the most important thing to do in that point of time, just go do that and, and keep moving. Don't worry about the process, worry about the week. Okay, what's been the most helpful trait to your success? What's a, what has not that successful, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, we see you as successful. So, what helped you get to where you are today? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll actually share very honest answers. I've screwed up a lot. I've made a ton of mistakes. Uh, I've been uh, a bad manager. I have been a bad, awful product thinker. I have written specs that I think are just completely lame. I have made UI that is so embarrassing. Oh my god! Um, I have, uh, you know, I have not written some of the code that I've written is so poorly architected. I can't believe a, a human could ever put something like that together. Uh, so I've done a ton of, made a ton of mistakes, right? Uh, and, and I think if anything, the one thing that has helped me in life is to just get up and say, I'm an idiot, but I'm now a lesser idiot, and let's keep moving forward, right? Because uh, honestly, the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. Um, and I think uh, that, that, is, that has really helped me a lot. And I think the other thing that has really helped me is I've been very lucky, uh, and, and people around me have been really patient with me. Uh, they have supported me, coached me in all sorts of ways. Uh, and you know, that, that has helped me immensely. Uh, but there's no, honestly, there's no magical thing that I have that you don't. And how do you use data, data mining, and data analytics for products, for product development, and all those insights? Sure. Uh, you know, similar to one of the discussions we were having earlier, uh, there are times when we absolutely, in my career at least, I've absolutely only used that, for example, when we do baby testing. And there are times when we've just not looked at the data at all because the data didn't matter. So it's, when, when we study product management in a quote unquote academic sense, or when we, you know, say take a product management course, you'll definitely have a module on, okay, using data, right? But as you start using data and, you know, develop the maturity around what does the data tell you, in fact, there's so many times when I've gone anti-data, right? The data said go left and I said, great, let's go right. You know why? Because everybody else is gonna go left. Everybody else is gonna look at the same charts and make that same bet. We will do the exact opposite, and that's why we want big time, right? So, data is important. The judgment around the data far more important. And I think you know, reading case studies is, is a really interesting way to develop your intuition around data. Another thing that that I found helpful is make seemingly non-data exercises in your life very much a data-driven exercise. Uh, say you're buying a home, right? Uh, try to make that a data exercise. Try to build a model and say, okay. You know, 70% uh, importance is to location, 30% importance is to price per square foot, or whatever that might be, right? Like build a model, build more comfort with the toolkit. It's a useful toolkit to have. Um, you know, data modeling, uh, just building Excel models. Uh, writing SQL queries, all of those things I think are too tactical and don't get you to the insight that at least you necessarily need as a product person. Yeah, um, right now, when you compare A-B testing with the Apple, do, right? Um, maybe that is a little bit um, uh, less riskier, right? Um, on a sense, I wanted to know since you had a lot of experience and a lot of processes, I wanted to know how have you implemented risk management and risk on implementing new features and on new adventures within inside the okay. Um, okay. So we're taking this two notches up now. We're not only just talking about optimization, but we're talking about risk management. You know, I haven't had to do that. Um, I know people in the world of finance, uh, a friend of mine is building out a hedge fund uh, software management tool for which risk management is a core part of the system. I, I haven't had to do that yet, and, and I'm kind of thankful that I haven't. 
<laughs> That's the last question. Yeah. Hey, uh, how about this? Can we just go around the room, you know, shoot out, let's say, five, six questions, and then we'll try to tackle uh, as many of them as we can. All right, why don't we start on the right side? So if you're to the right of the gentleman in the blue shirt, Speak now or that's it. Alright, um, just a question that connects a little bit to what the issues that we're waiting for. Um, obviously, the end game of satisfying the six needs would be the uh, absolute perfect product. Uh, it's spearheaded, I guess, by a framework. And, and um, artificial intelligence seems to be representing that end game now. Um, the news, a news came out three days ago that Facebook disabled an artificial intelligence engine because it's created its own language that its creators or any user could not understand. So what I wanted to ask is, as we grow forward, and in that mentality of um, uh, move fast and break things, the stakes are getting higher and higher. So at which point it becomes uh, a danger or liability or risk to move fast and break things? Actually, you know, I'll answer that question really quickly. So, Facebook has removed the break things part from from the ethos, right? We are we are now moving fast. Okay. So. Can you talk about how you apply these principles to venture capital process? How to apply this to venture capital? All right. <coughs> okay, I'm in the luxury retail industry, so luxury probably I'm, okay. I'm the only one here. But I just wanted to hear a little bit from your point of view. Now that uh, retail is changing simultaneously with online, Amazon, and everything that's happening, what is Facebook doing now for that? And also, what do you recommend for retail companies? Since there's a lot of initiatives, new programs, and things that are happening, but what do you recommend which should be the focus? Okay. Thank you for the question. Uh, kind, of, kind of follow up on the VC's uh, question. I'm also a VC. Um, what would you recommend that I tell, you know, someone who pitches me a product line or what have you, tell them, you know, what's the best bang for your buck out of the six needs and which one is most accessible in order to create value for your product? Okay, so VC and six needs, I want Okay. Uh, have you ever been a user of your own products and as what? a user, have you seen it success and fail when you use it? Success or fail? Sure, happy to. What do you think about steaming? What do I think about? Steaming? That's the steaming. name. Yeah. What's the best strategy for product awareness? That's a pretty <laughs> uh, wide span of questions here in the last minute or two. Okay. Uh, what would be most useful to all of us in the room is what I'm thinking about and then, you know, if I didn't specifically answer a question, just come chat with me afterwards. Um, product Hunt, great resource. Random Google searching, a great way to find out about cool new stuff that's out there. Um, product awareness is also, I think, uh, uh, fundamentally a function of scratching your own itch, right? So I set Google alerts for things that I'm always looking for, right? Uh, I was recently, a couple, a couple years ago, looking for a kayak for diamond searches. Uh, because I was thinking Jeep Blue Nile is only one retailer, what if I had a kayak for that? And I found a company called Rare Carrots, which does that. So, you know, I have literally dozens of these Google Alerts set up for things that I believe should exist. And, and of everything else, that has proven to be a pretty cool tool for me uh, that, I, that I can uh, point to as a specific example. The rest, man, is just happenstance. There's so much happening uh, in, in the landscape. Products that I've used that uh, I've been disappointed in, uh, gosh, I mean, every product that I use, every single product that I've used, uh, especially the ones that I have been involved with, you know, I'm, because I'm the, the product person on that product, I'm closest to its flaws. Uh, so if anything, I, I almost hate every single product that I worked on. <laughs> right? Because I'm like, oh, that is broken. Oh, this is broken. And this, because, you know, I just know it's so intimate. <laughs> Right, that I know there's someone out there whom I our product is letting down. Uh, you know, Google search, Google search ads, uh, Google sign in, Facebook. Like, it's it's. I think it's an occupational hazard of being that close to something uh, because you know it's flaws. Even and every product has flaws. So, uh, you know, unfortunate uh, consequence of becoming a product manager is you just. You're never satisfied, especially with the things that, that are closest to you that you care about the most. Um, I'll answer your question in person if that's okay. Um, venture capital and using these needs. 
I think that a lot of uh, venture capital, at least in my view, when I do my investments, and at Petrona, when I, uh, you know, when we did some investments. Uh, by the way, it's been a great week for Madrona. We just uh, IPO'd with Redfin. Uh, Redfin, as some of you may know, a uh, real estate company. And you know, one of my, my partners, uh, Redfin was a story of you know, literally a few guys in the apartment, a digi apartment, and, and Paul Goodrich going into the apartment and kind of salvaging the company, if you will. Uh, so pretty, pretty cool to see this company in such a great, uh, you know, such a huge IPO success and such a great customer success. Uh, I miss my Madrona days, so it's fun to pontificate. But to answer this question, um, I don't think that in, in the world of venture, any any rule applies. I don't think that you know total total addressable market, big or small, they are they are corner cases, right? Because the the market does not exist yet. You are creating a new market. That's the whole point of being a startup is to create needs that is, you know that people didn't know were unmet, right? Um, the, the, the need psychology useful tool, I won't say it's the be all end all. I think it's it, what's valuable is if your team has the appreciation and the ability to learn quickly. Uh, I think that's huge. I think if your team has the ability and the passion to move fast, get stuff done, is committed to the problem, I think that's huge. If they have insights that nobody does, right, uh, because they've been in the industry for years. Uh, decades, if they, they are telling you things which at first glance you think, no way man, I just don't believe you, it cannot be X, right? Talk to that entrepreneur, like run and talk to that entrepreneur because you know what? That person knows something which nobody else does and that's a key reason why they might just win, right? Uh, Uber is a great case, case study for this, right? Nobody liked, uh, nobody believed the narrative that Travis was believing. Uh, which is why very few people decided to jump into that space, which is why Uber had such a head start, right? If, if the idea is so obvious, it would have already been done, or someone in some large corporation would have already pitched it, and then it's not the best thing for a startup to go pursue it, at least generally speaking. And so far as partnering with retail and Facebook, you know, it's a very domain-specific question, not something that I'm in a position to answer. Uh, thank you so much, guys.